So Dr. Moling, it is so nice to have you on the Fem Power Health podcast. I really appreciate you making time. Endometriosis is near and dear to my heart since I have it and have been so in touch with the community um, since I was diagnosed. I think it was 2014 when I learned that I have it. Um, but Almost I, a decade uh, now. Yes, that's right. But unlike many women, I have, I guess, what some characterize as silent endometriosis because I don't have the obvious symptoms, but there are so, so many who struggle. Um, and it is a complicated disease and a very um, tight community um, who has a lot of emotions and, and views about this topic. And so, you know, this is part of a four part series because it is such an important condition to talk about. So before we dive into it, I'd love for you to share with us your expertise um, in relation to endometriosis and anything else you would like to share before we get started in the, in the discussion. Yeah, I think that involves a little bit of my giving you my background, which, Please. which uh, I started out, well, I started out 40 years ago as a massage therapist. And so that informs a lot of what I later become became over all these years. So while I was being a massage therapist, I realized I loved anatomy. I loved working with people. And so I went back and did pre-med and then got into med school, went to med school and became an OBGYN. And while I was training as an OBGYN in residency, I also had a kind of a focus on pelvic pain, even back, this would have been in the late nineties. And uh, then I worked in, in private practice in a small community in northern New Mexico, at, uh, Taos, New Mexico, and really was a generalist, delivered babies, took care of everyone, did their pap smears, did their hysterectomies, did delivered babies, ran a midwifery program, you know, did kind of the whole thing in a small community. And at age 50, I realized I was ready to go back, refocus, learn minimally invasive techniques. There was no robot when I trained. And so it was a very bold, unusual move to make as a 50 year old person, um, being in a small community, ha you know, having a full active general practice and then deciding to go back and focus. And, and when I did my minimally invasive training that luckily, amazingly, I got a fellowship at that age. It was a very radical shift. So having been a doc for 15 plus years, 15 to 20 years, and then going back, I really brought with me a lot of wisdom from having cared for a community, a single community for so many years. And I happened to be in a fellowship where the training had a lot to do with endometriosis and excision and very rigorous um, skill development to be able to dissect out ureters, go into the, all the deep um, avascular spaces of the pelvis, not be afraid of the diaphragm. And so this training I had in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, allowed me to totally transform my career. And I worked uh, for a few years in, Ch in Tennessee um, as director of gynecology for a residency program, and then moved to Portland and ultimately have spent the last two years entirely focusing on pelvic pain and endometriosis, working with Nick Fogelson, which is an incredible blessing. He's a, um, an, a truly gifted, kind man of integrity, a really great person to work with. And he really gave me the courage to just do it and say, okay, I'm gonna focus exclusively on this one thing because not enough people do. And in order to really do it well, you need to make that your full-time focus, I think. We don't have enough people because the surgeries are as challenging as cancer surgeries. And we don't have a specialty training just for endometriosis. So I, I fell into this. And in a way, when I look back at my earliest part of my career, it was all about pain then too, my, my, my deepest interest. And it just carried me through until um, now I'm really kind of at the, the full deep focus of my career. Dr. Moling, that is um, quite an incredible background. Wow. <laughs> so, <It's different. laughs> yeah, no, it is. And, you know, be, I mean, it is hard to, to find a doctor who is trained in endometriosis. And just because of what you had brought up, I'd love to even just start with um, 
the challenge with finding the right doctor and, and why it's so important and just the dynamics of what you're seeing with your own surgical colleagues and the patients that that you're running across, like tell us this this dynamic, um, maybe like what's surprising to you about it that would help people understand as they're navigating this. Yeah, so, so I myself, prior to the last decade, I didn't realize that you were supposed to excise endo. I had no idea. And in training, we don't learn that. It's, it's a, in a way, uh, a newer thing over the last couple of decades to even think about excising the disease, right? And so I learned, like all OBGYN residents across the country, that you diagnose, you might burn a few things, you might biopsy maybe, remove a cyst if it's in the endometrial, in, in the ovary, an endometrium of the ovary, and and then consider medications, it, it, birth control. You know, I learned all those very basic medications, burn a few spots, diagnose it, not a lot we can do. That was what I learned. And that is what I think the vast majority of gynecologists learn in residency. And so there are these few cowboy and cowgirl pioneers who are saying, uh, actually, there is this one way that patients feel better. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's daring to go out and do this thing that isn't part of the mainstream education and trust that this is actually what should be done. And, and so I get a lot of validation when patients write to me and say, I've never felt better than I have felt since you did my surgery two years ago, or I'm finally pregnant after 10 years, or I, I can't, you know, I can finally digest my food and not feel bloated or, or any number of things. And, and so when I, when I, it's really, really helpful when I hear from patients because it reminds me that yes, I am doing the right thing, right? I see them in the short term and they seem to be thriving and doing better, but it's when I really hear long-term from patients that I remember, oh, this is why I'm doing this, this, this kind of crazy excision of disease that, that is not mainstream, right? It's really and not mainstream. And so of course, all these patients with devastating disease uh, involving their bowel, involving their ureters, involving their diaphragm, their docs have no idea and have no idea what to do with it uh, because we aren't really taught. And, and most of them, if they encounter really advanced stage disease, we'll send them to a GYN oncologist who will offer them hysterectomy and removal of their ovaries. And then, like I see over and over, invasive bowel disease, invasive ure ureteral disease, I'm having to remove a section of ureter and get re uh, nef um, the renal docs to reimplant the ureter. This is what happens if you leave the endometriosis and you remove the ovaries and uterus. The endometriosis still keeps going. Wow. Even in the absence of taking hormone therapy. So it, it definitely a revolution is taking place and patients, they are pushing that, that revolution to say, wait, what's been done for the last 50 years isn't working. Mm -hmm. These birth controls pills make me feel terrible. They increase my risk of certain other problems and we need something better. And so those of us who are doing this are kind of few and far between partly because it takes a lot of skill to separate a ureter from disease or collaborate with someone to remove a section of bowel or cut a disc of disease out of bowel, or when it goes through the vagina, cut a hole through the vagina and sew it up. There aren't very many people who do that. So how does someone who, well, I guess at maybe take us through this, this diagnostic pathway to when they come to you, um, I guess, what is the best case scenario of what might happen um, and maybe one of some maybe a challenging scenario of something you've seen so ideally what should be happening i'm assuming a woman has pelvic pain goes to their obgyn and i guess that in and of itself is interesting because there's different ways to be able to assess whether someone has endo some say maybe they won't catch it the only way you can really 
um, diagnose it is through laparoscopic surgery. And then there are these indicators like Receptiva DX, which um, looks at the BCL6, B, BCL6 marker mm -hmm. um, and a few others. So, uh, you know, I don't know how much you're involved with that side so or have deep I, knowledge. I, I don't use those um, diagnostic kit tools because uh, they aren't entirely useful to me. There's a, cert a certain protocol and they're used primarily, I would say, by infertility specialists and, they, and their use is very specific to finding inflammatory changes in the uterus that aren't only specific to endometriosis, but that are very helpful to guide re regarding IVF. So that being said, um, when I think one of the root problems is that we aren't training people well enough these days on physical exam and everyone relies on imaging. And so over and over and over again, a patient with endometriosis is going to have a normal ultrasound and often even a normal MRI. And yet they might have stage three, four plus disease and they have normal imaging. Um, and so I don't know if it's because of my unusual massage therapy background or, or just having really focused on how to feel this disease and find what, where pain is coming from. But when I do my exam, I can feel if there are rectovaginal nodules on the uterosacral ligament, I can feel if there's an obliterated cul-de-sac. Um, and so I'm very specifically feeling not just the uterus and ovaries, but behind the cervix. I'm looking with my speculum, not at the cervix, but behind the cervix. I want to see, is there, is there a penetration of disease? Over and over, I, I find disease penetrating all the way through the vagina that no one's seen because the speculum covers it up and they're just looking at the cervix. Mm. So, so we, we need to be doing better exams. I'm, I'm able many, many times to diagnose endometriosis in the office by my exam, by doing my own ultrasounds, by looking to see how tissue moves, by evaluating for adenomyosis, for looking at whether an ovary is stuck to a uterus by, so I do my own ultrasounds. I do very thorough pelvic exams and I have, I would say 95% accuracy by the time I go to the OR, I know where that disease is going to be as far as my fingers can reach. Now, right. I can't always predict diaphragm disease. I can't yeah. reach that. I don't have a way to reach that. But their story often tells me whether it's going to be there. And I have a, um, I put the patients in um, tilted head up, bef you know, usually in pelvic surgery, the head's down. But as I'm examining the diaphragm and, and the underneath the liver, around the liver, I, am, I have the patient head up before I start my case. Got it. So um, getting back to ultrasound and MRI, MRI for me is very useful if I'm suspicious of bowel disease or bowel invasion. Sometimes it'll be negative and I'll still have invasive disease, but um, it, I find it the most useful for confirming adenomyosis that I suspect on ultrasound when a patient really is reluctant for hysterectomy and wants to know for sure this is part of the problem. Um, so for, for evaluating the uterus and evaluating for bowel disease, I find MRI very valuable. Okay. Um, my own ultrasounds are super valuable for me for preoperatively mapping and knowing what I'm expecting to find. Am I going to find an endometrioma? Am I going to find an ovary that's stuck on one side? Is, is, and so I'm, I'm, I'm assessing all of those things to help me no, am I going to be able to help someone? Right. So my tools are really, really thorough physical exam, mm -hmm. my own ultrasounds, and then MRI when indicated. So I don't routinely get MRI unless I suspect bowel disease. Okay. Now I, I know that a lot of people rely on these imaging and sometimes question it. I've also heard in other countries, they're more powerful. I'm curious if you have any comments on that. Yeah. And so it's also going to depend on your radiologist and okay. their expertise with seeing rectovaginal disease, for example, do okay. they see adhesions? Do they see fusion? Um, so those radiologists who are skilled at seeing endometriosis are, 
are not every day and everywhere. Okay. Uh, and, and perhaps in Europe, they have some additional training. I, I don't know. But I do know that the, the recent European standards are that everyone gets an MRI. And I think they have a whole different protocol that they, they might get diagnosed by routine gynecologists and then all patients with advanced endometriosis get referred to specialty centers. Okay. And so the MRI is really useful in that scenario. Okay. Got it. Now you, we've talked about pain and pregnancy. I do want to, to jump into that first with relation to pregnancy. There was a recent report published, um, where clinicians are sharing with patients that pregnancy is a way to treat or help with endometriosis. And this is a paper that was out of Australia. And they, I guess, did a survey of the impact of physicians saying that. Um, so I would more like your reaction to why physicians are saying that and is it even true? So can we, let's not assess yeah, the data. So I, unfortunately, I haven't seen the paper and, and the paper actually wouldn't really interest me because right. I think it's baloney. Um, so uh, we know for sure that endometriosis does not cure, or sorry, pregnancy does not cure endometriosis at all. Now, some patients feel massively worse if they have endometriosis while they are pregnant. Some feel better. Um, some probably feel stable. And I, I, I'm not sure. It's very, to me, it's a very old fashioned, old school approach to say, just get pregnant, you know, you'll feel better. And maybe it's that you, you have a baby and the pain of labor is so bad, you forget about your endo pain, and then you're raising a kid and you kind of just, I think, I think we often, uh, as women and mothers, we just ignore our bodies and just take care of everybody else. Um, and uh, I don't, I, so I, completely I, unfair I, I, I have no idea how to answer that. Okay. <laughs> All I can tell you is that it is never been proven in the literature that it actually cures or helps an endometriosis. Okay. And I, I, I think it's just a myth. Yes. Well, what about the next part, which is why one might need, or I guess how having surgery would help potentially with fertility. So I will tell you the rule of thumb, so to speak, when I was going through my own fertility journey. So um, I was told, you know, if you have it, you should, you know, get the surgery. Well, I actually had the surgery to get diagnosed and then they finished everything and took it out. And then um, some said you have 12 months where the surgery is quote unquote good so that you can try to get pregnant within that time. I did not. And about six months later, I did an IVF and got pregnant. And it never, I never understood why I needed the IVF, but quite honestly, I was 40 and this was it for me because I was just so done with my four year journey. Um, and I bring this up only because having interviewed so many experts and having been really close to this women's health space for four years, just with the podcast and talking to patients, um, what I find is that women kind of enter the, I must be proactive about my body space. I mean, granted with the you know younger um, women, it's a little bit different, um, but not necessarily in all parts of the world. Um, so I don't wanna make a, a blanket assumption, but it does seem like when women need to go to the doctor to get birth control, when they're struggling with fertility, once they have the baby and are really struggling with menopause symptoms, those seem to be the entry points into the healthcare system and then the alarm bells of, oh my God, I need to know more. That seems to be what I've seen as a trend. And so, you know, let's assume now someone's coming into this and they have infertility, which they're trying to figure out and learn and are overwhelmed by. And then they hear this endometriosis and they're trying to figure out surgery, IVF. Do I need the IVF? Can you kind of just explain all mm -hmm. of that? Yeah. So my perspective is from someone who treats endo yep. and someone who treats infertility may have a slightly different perspective and that's and fair. Our, our literature is a little different but uh we do know that 70 to 80 percent of infertility is caused by endometriosis right so it's a big one it's a big one for infertility there are different ways that endometriosis can cause infertility 
the, the most dramatic way is when you have very advanced disease. You have tubes that are dilated and blocked. You have endometrioma of the ovary. So the ovaries are not functioning as well. And so basically the tubes that would get you to the uterus, sperm, uter egg, connect, get back to the uterus are blocked and you just have anatomic disability to conceive. So that's one way. But a lot of patients don't have such advanced disease and yet they still have infertility. And so I think some of this is theoretic, some of it is proven, but the, the general prevailing thought is that the lesions of endometriosis are associated with peritoneal inflammation, right? So probably the lesions are releasing this or the body is trying to deal with these lesions it's chicken or egg. We don't know exactly for sure in all cases, but we do know that that peritoneal fluid has high levels of cytokines, IL-6, uh, macrophages, inflammatory markers, and that this appears to be hostile for connecting the sperm and the egg and for the developing embryo too, right? This whole environment is is a heightened inflammatory environment that is counterproductive for fertility, right? So that same environment of the peritoneal fluid being um, inflamed, if you will, probably is part of what affects bowel function too. So you may not have a completely invasive lesion into the bowel, into the intestines, but you still have bloating discomfort with your with bowels, uh, alternating constipation and diarrhea, and yet no lesion is invading the bowel, what's going on? Probably what's going on is you've still got that fluid that's creating this kind of constant hostile environment for, for the, the person's body, as well as for uh, sperm and egg meeting up and affecting fertility. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. I was actually on a, um, an autoimmune protocol during my fertility treatments um, towards the end, which is what got me pregnant. And what's interesting is um, I tried again using frozen eggs from before, and it was the only other time that I got pregnant. It was a chemical pregnancy, but never, ever did I get pregnant at all for four years. And since I had the surgery and was on an autoimmune protocol, I got pregnant and then had a chemical pregnancy. So it's, uh, it is really, really fascinating. Um, so then let's talk about the surgery because, you know, the other interesting part is this, do you need it again? Will it come back? Um, and then some people will have the surgery and they still have pain. So what I would love to demystify here is, you know, is it that the surgery wasn't complete and not all the lesions were found? Did it actually just come back? Do we not have all the data? Because I know, for example, I learned in talking to Katie, who was um, a guest as well, about these hidden pockets that many will, many surgeons may miss. Um, and so could it be that that's what was missed and why someone may still have pain? So can you talk to us a little bit about this, yeah, definitely. That. So um, it's tricky. Pain is really tricky and multifactorial, right? Yes. Especially when a person has this disease. I believe they have it from birth, that it's congenital. I believe endometriosis is mostly congenital. And that you hit menarche, you begin having hormonal release from your ovaries, and that stimulates endometriosis and pain begins. So it's, it, you know, we, we, we could use to have a study, but, but no one would want to enter into a study where you get randomized to being having fulguration or excision. <laughs> and so I think there's enough knowledge that that's going to be a really hard study to have. But I think that a lot of patients have, think they have excision surgery and they have a regular gynecologist who burns a few areas snips a few obvious areas that are little spot excisions and 
Um, and then the patient wonders why they had recurrence, right? And then they probably didn't do anything if it was on the bowel, and they probably didn't do anything if it was on the diaphragm, and I'm sure they didn't do anything if it was on the ureter because that is like, oh, that was too dangerous, they would say. So, so I think a lot of disease that recurs is inadequately treated, and yet we call it recurrent. It's really just persistent, not recurrent is my, is my, my guess, right? Now, I've also seen some people with recurrent pain who've had one of the people who we know do radical excision and they have some recurrent pain and maybe spot of recurrent disease. But when I go back in on someone who I know went to one of the people who is known to do really radical excision like I do, there's not a lot of disease. I might find one spot and, and it's where the person said, I feel I have something. And when you're dealing with stage four disease, you may leave a few cells behind. You're doing as much as you can to, to radically remove disease, but in some cases you can't, right? Especially if you're leaving a uterus, you're leaving ovaries. You're, and if, if disease is everywhere, like an, a bomb went off, you cannot remove it all if you're preserving fertility, especially. So those patients are going to need some somewhere down the line. They're, they're probably going to need another surgery because they've got adenomyosis leaking out of the uterus, connecting to the bowel. They're in, they're going to end up with a problem, right? And, and, and an invasive problem later. So I, I think that when it is truly excised, that area will not recur, Right. And one of the keys is that disease is subtle. So uh, sometimes I'll take care of someone who is surgically menopausal from hysterectomy and removal of ovaries for endo, and they didn't remove the, the disease. And I'll go in and I'll see this like cobweb appearance of the tissue, this sort of white ghost-like stuff, and it comes back off in positive for endo right? But it looks very different. And some people would say it looks fine. It's just scar tissue, leave it alone. But yet the person has recurrent pain, continued pain, you know, affecting their bowel function, affecting everything, no uterus, no ovaries, this white sort of ghost-like lesion, and they still have endo, right? So if, if, if they had a hysterectomy and removal of ovaries, that's certainly not going to be the treatment if the endo is left behind. I've also seen it where the, the invasion is, is extraordinary with fibrosis and, and invasion of other structures post-hysterectomy. Um, okay, so remind me the question again. I think I got sidetracked. No, it's okay. About, you know, this about the pain we were start you started off by saying it's multifactorial so right. like can it really yes okay okay let away. me go back yeah so then also i will see fairly good uh, patients who've had someone who i know of who's a good minimally invasive surgeon has done their their procedure and i'll see that they've taken spots where that was most focused and they didn't do wide peritonectomy and they didn't even really look in the cul-de-sac they're going to miss some disease and that person is going to have recurrent pain. Then I also like to think about I, when I'm examining someone, I'm, I'm evaluating what other sources of pain are there. So there's myofascial pain, there's bladder pain, there's bowel pain, there's neuropathic pain, and there's endometriosis. Those are the main chronic pain triggers. And so did someone forget to think about interstitial cystitis or just not even think about it? Uh, do they have food sensitivities that they truly have bowel issues that are related to food sensitivities? Um, I, I don't know if you're aware, I have a recent publication on intestinal permeability showing an association between endometriosis and intestinal permeability. It doesn't mean one caused the other. We don't know. We just know that in half my patients with endo, there was a presence of intestinal permeability. So we know that there is an inflammatory piece. Intestinal permeability is part of that. It has to do with um, gut and the immune system. 
we know from a lot of data that there's a microbiome piece. Um, and, and I suspect that for some patients, they have endo, but they also have concomitant bowel issues related to food sensitivities. We, we know there's an association between celiac disease and endo. So there's this like autoimmune question. I don't think it's an autoimmune disease, but I do believe that a lot of the autoimmune type um, triggers and um, problems are seen in patients with endometriosis as well. And, so, um, and that make and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, just putting all these pieces together. Another question is around the excision. What I've understood is similar to oncologists when they're removing a tumor, they don't just take out the tumor and that's it. It's like the area around it as well. Yeah. So ideally wide you're, you're not missing it. Okay. So wide margins. Okay. Yeah. So how and and um, Megan Wasson from um, Mayo in Arizona did a, a nice study publication that demonstrated that wide peritonectomy was more effective than spot excision. Okay. And, and I think that really confirms what a lot of us have been doing. Okay. And when I do my preoperative exam and I note, say, that someone has specific discomfort on one side in the cul-de-sac, I'm going to take extra time to look, look around there and excise tissue there. And that's when I sometimes find these crazy hidden pockets which also to me speaks to the fact, I believe that endometriosis is congenital. Got it. Um, tell me more about that. About so, when, so when the embryo is developing, yep. another, another term is mullerianosis. So as the mullerian system, which is, which is the upper third of the vagina, the uterus tubes is developing, those cells are migrating down you know, in the developing embryo, migrating down to begin to form the, the reproductive organs. And for whatever reason, I think some cells get stuck along the way okay. during embryogenesis and that those are the cells that become dysfunctional and become endometriosis later. Also endosalpingiosis is this kind of cousin to endometriosis and, and endometriosis cells look like glands that line, line the uterus in the endometrium and endosalpingiosis looks like the cells that line the fallopian tube. They, they are both found um, in the peritoneum in a dysfunctional way causing pain. Okay. Interesting. And can be seen on pathology reports. It's really interesting. I, always I've just, oh, endosampangiosis, what's that? I ignored that in the early part of my career. Now I realize, oh, well, that's something too. That, <laughs> that, that seems to be hand in hand with endometriosis. So how would I, as a woman, because not all of us, you know, um, work in healthcare. And honestly, I worked in healthcare and still couldn't figure this out. So that doesn't even necessarily help. So how does anyone trying to navigate this, like what would be your words of, of wisdom? Because it, it's, it's, um, complicated yet not in the sense of, you know, you need to find the right surgeon. Um, if you're having pain, which most do, um, it could be as simple as you didn't get all the endo. It could be, oh, you have celiac and it should have been diagnosed. It could be these other things that you were talking about that can contribute to pain. So it's not so black and white. So um, maybe we can first talk about, well, let's go to the surgeon last. Let's talk about this more complicated part of, you know, how do you know, is it, I need more surgery or look into other factors? Like how would one, and is it the surgeon that they go to? or the OBGYN, because they're not necessarily trained in endo. How, like, what would be the even type of clinician you'd go to, to navigate that? Because we it are should, all, it should be a gynecologist. And I okay. think a lot of gynecologists these days, um, reflexively send patients to pelvic floor physical therapy, okay. which is great because I think pelvic floor PT physical therapists are very skilled at understanding what's pelvic floor problem and what's 
what's something they can't address? What's something higher up that might be endo? Um, and, and increasingly, I would say there is more and more training for pelvic floor physical therapists, and they do a great job in helping make that diagnosis. 20 years ago, the, a pelvic floor PT was far rare and far between, right? Yeah. Now we have more access and, and they're super valuable in helping guide patients. So I think that's one area and one place that, that, that patients can start. They can request that okay. trying to understand is this, is this bladder, is this bowel, is this pelvic floor, or is this something higher up and I need surgery? And I, I would say increasingly our pelvic floor therapists are a tremendous resource in helping understand and helping deal with a very big component of pelvic pain. So if you for years have terrible endometriosis and, and debilitating pain, you're going to be in a contracted state, right? So that contracture long-term on the pelvis, abdominal muscles is adding to the pain mm -hmm. at the very least, right? Some of it may be long-standing pelvic floor pain that has nothing to do with endometriosis, but they, they, it, it, it may be, it may be both. And so the physical therapists are really good at addressing a component of the pain. Okay. And so that's one area. Um, I do think that some patients respond really well to birth control pills. I, I see most of my patients do not want them, but I think a a lot of patients use birth control pills. They love that their periods are lighter. They feel better. Or patients use an IUD. That helps ameliorate their pain. If that works for them, then that's a great a great point of um, stabilization for that point in their lives, right? If it's not working, that's a sign you really need further evaluation. Okay. Do you have to have surgery if you have endo? Because like I'm thinking of me... I had no pain. Let's say I wasn't trying to get pregnant. Is like, what is the harm in keeping endo in your body? I mean, cause like, I also understand like you want to get the surgery cause if it gets worse, then it can be worse. So there's this weird dynamic that I guess I'm trying to put the puzzle together. If yeah. you have it, so not everybody gets worse. <laughs> ah. You know, there, it's, it's interesting. There's some disease that's kind of widespread peritoneal disease. And then there's some disease that's like everything is glued together and you have a frozen pelvis. It's hard to know who has what, right? Oh my gosh. So, so I think that, no, you know, the, the, there is a very small, maybe a 0.1% 1, 1 risk of malignant transformation when you have endometriosis in the later years, there's some malignant transformation. Same with adenomyosis. There's about a 1% risk of adenomyosis becoming an adenocarcinoma. So there are inherent risks, but it's low. It's a low risk. So if you have silent endometriosis and you um, aren't really bothered by it, you're not worrying about your fertility, you want to just get to menopause, I, 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 don't, I don't think we have to go aggressively. There is risk of surgery too. So, yeah. so one has to weigh that out. It's, it's really an individual basis. Yep. Absolutely. What about um, the hysterectomy? I promise you I'll ask about the surgeon. But, um, you know, I know generally that that ACOG has said, okay, OBGYNs, you know, we probably think hysterectomy first too early, too often. Let's start really thinking about what else is going on with a woman before we start giving hysterectomies. Um, so tell us about how you are seeing that with endo, like how would a woman be able to make an informed consent decision? Because that's yeah. what's hard is, and I know that there isn't a perfect answer and it is her choice, but what all should a woman know before having to make that choice? Yeah. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to bring up one really important thing before I answer that question, please, which is uh, that I've also taken care of a number of trans masculine persons with endometriosis, pelvic pain, and really young, you know, young people really, really don't want their uterus. 
I, I'm happy to take their uterus out, right? And so, and also their endometriosis at the same time. So right. I think I think that that I, I just want to acknowledge that it's not just women, but also thank you, transmasculine patients with really painful uterus, painful periods, r- not wanting that at all. And so for them, hysterectomy may often be first line choice in yep. addition to excision. I, I, ne- I think never should hysterectomy be done without um, excision if there's endo. Yes. So um, the next part of your question is that, yes, it's very individual. And oftentimes patients are coming to me and knowing they want hysterectomy and they want excision. And so then I'm evaluating, helping them decide what's the right choice. There are risks of hysterectomy too. And if you don't do it right, you can have some vaginal fall prolapse. You, you might um, have, well, there's, there's just an increased surgical complications with hysterectomy itself. So it has to be, there has to be a good reason for it. And a lot of times, so maybe 25% of the time, there will be adenomyosis. And it really makes sense if they're done with childbearing, if they don't want their uterus for another reason, if they have uterine pain on exam, not just posterior cul-de-sac, adnexal pain, bladder pain, but actual uterine pain, they might feel better with hysterectomy. On the other hand, I do a lot of what I call fertility optimizing surgery. And so we do know there there, um, was some great data from um, um, uh, Ted Lee's group in in, um, Pennsylvania that from McGee that showed you could have a very similar relief of pain with excision only and not hysterectomy, right? And that did not include people who had adenomyosis. Okay. So it's very important to know, number one, what the whole story is and what the patient's desire is. So that, that, that conversation is the most essential piece. Okay. What do they want? Do they want to just never look back, never have another period? They've had, they want to be with their kids. They just totally, that's, the, that's where they want to go. Sometimes hysterectomy is the right choice. Yep. Sometimes there is significant adenomyosis and hysterectomy becomes the right choice. And sometimes for whatever reason, it's not the right choice to remove the uterus and removing the endometriosis makes a difference. It makes a difference in pain, in fertility, and in in long term well being. Sometimes you never have to remove the uterus, but over and over again, I'm reminded: removing the uterus, removing the ovaries, that doesn't do the that doesn't treat it. Does that okay. help answer yes. the question? No, it yeah. does. It does. I, um, you know, I really do have a lot of compassion for people who do need to have a hysterectomy. Like I, I sometimes think, you know. What if I ever had to, to have it for, for any reason? And I, um, I get really upset. And so I have a lot of, um, I, I just can't imagine, especially if you're one who like does truly does not want to have one. Um, yeah. Well, and, yeah. and in, in those cases, we do everything we can. Or yeah. I do everything I can. Yeah. So with the surgery, um, what about pelvic PT? So I interviewed Caitlin uh, Tavi, who is pelvic floor um, a physical therapist. And she was talking about definitely seeing one after surgery, um, possibly even before, and just the value that they can bring. Are you finding that that's fairly common practice? And what are your thoughts about that? That's definitely common in our practice at Good. Northwest Endometriosis here in Portland. And, and in Portland, we have this just robust, amazing pelvic floor collective uh, of physical therapists, massage therapists, and they, they meet monthly, um, really they, they, they educate themselves. I've, I've spoken with them uh, a few times. And so we have tremendous access here in the Northwest. I don't think every community has that same kind of access, but 
a lot of times my patients are coming to me because the physical therapist said, you know, there may be something else going on. You should think about endo. And so then I see them, they go back to physical therapy afterwards. Okay. Many of my patients who are local, I like to get them set up with PT afterwards. Okay. And some patients feel so much better after excision. They, they don't really feel like they want PT, but okay. for most, it can be a tremendous benefit. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now I'd love to talk about some of these other treatments, um, on the market. So we talked about birth control already. Um, you know, there's my Fembri or Alyssa. Um, obviously we talked about surgery. Um, I don't know if you had thoughts about, um, any of these that you wanted to share. Well, I, I think by the time patients come to me, they're really looking for surgery and okay. they really want excision and they want as much surgically done as they can. So I'm not managing chronic endometriosis medically at all. Um, but there's also a reason that I don't, which is I, I find it really disappointing that the medications are, are so promoted and yet they only temporize pain. They don't really treat the disease. We don't have data saying it makes the disease go away. And right. so there's this significant side effect profile, bone loss concern, joint pain concern, and so on for six months to two years of pain relief. And then you're back pretty much where you started, increasing pain back again over the next year. So I think that there are certain times when it might be valuable to use uh, one of the GN GNRH analogs. For example, during pandemic, we had a limitation on being able to operate. And so there, that was a time when you might have wanted to temporize a situation for someone who's incapacitated in pain. Right. I don't like patients to be on them prior to surgery because they do suppress the lesions and make them a little harder to see. And then in theory, I, you know, I think the lesions kind of re-express when you come off the medication. Got it. So I want to be able to see everything when I'm in there and, and lesions can look subtle in a teenager, in a menopausal person, and can look anywhere from very subtle to very extreme. So those subtle lesions are the ones I don't want to miss. Okay. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm obviously not going to miss an endometrioma or a, a frozen pelvis, but, but the, some of that subtle peritoneal disease could be suppressed. Okay. So back to finding a surgeon. So for those who can't reach you, <laughs> um, cause I know that there's a company, I always forget the name of it, but I know they purchased Nancy's nook. Um, I care and, better. Yes. Thank you. And they, um, you know, I, I've looked at their website and I have to say I struggle. And again, I, I support anyone who is trying to help. So I, I, I hope no one takes this as a poo-poo on anything because I'm, I'm not a surgeon. I'm not an expert, so I can't evaluate it. But it was just interesting to me. I looked at it and um, is it enough? Um, or are there other, evaluate, other things that women should also take into account as they're trying to find? <laughs> well a surgeon. I'm, I'm on that website okay. and only because I recognize that there were enough patients who were going to want to want a vetting system who are going to look on that yep. site. And so I chose to, to be on that site, but there are lots of amazing surgeons who are not on that site who want nothing to do with paying to be on it. And, and, Got and it. you have to, you have to submit your, your work and, and there's, you know, a tribunal who evaluates whether or not you're eligible to be on this site. So, uh, I, I think that, that it's, it's not the ultimate list of, of who can actually do a surgery, right? There, okay. there are many others. Nancy Snook has done a good job in a way to find who's really focused and interested in endo and who is someone who a patient might want to find in all regions of the country and even the world, I think. Uh, so it's a tough thing. And, and not every state even has a specialist who really uh, believes in excision of endo. It's really tough. I don't, I don't, I actually don't know how, 
how patients are doing it. And there aren't enough of us who are devoted to it. So one of the things is some people don't know if they even have it. Right. And yep. so if they have, uh, they don't have say out of, I, Nick and I are out of network benefit. We use out of network benefits. Some people are just cash, but you still need insurance to cover your hospital, your anesthesia, use of the OR and so forth. I think that for some patients who are in more rural communities who don't have the financial a access and just want to know what they've got, I think most gynecologists can at least make a diagnosis, can do a laparoscopy, take a lot of photographs, maybe biopsy something, and then they know what they've got. They've got, got a set of photos and they know, all right, I have this disease. Now, ultimately, I've got to find the right person to take care of me. Okay. Um, and this is this is sort of the European model. Um, in in Europe, I think routine gynecologists will make a diagnosis. They'll do a laparoscopy, a couple little cuts in and out, and then the patient knows. Okay, I've got stage four disease. I really need to go up to Verona or Milan and have you know my surgery done by an expert. That model may work for some of our our people in in more rural areas or just in states that don't have excision experts. Right. So at least they can get a very clear understanding and a diagnosis. Yep. Yeah. And that's then fair. they can make a choice. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to use a uh, birth control pills for a year and save my money or get insurance or, you know, but, but finding out what's really going on is number one. Now, when someone comes to me or someone comes to one of the other people who actually do this, type of disease, I'm going to diagnose and treat at the same time. Yep. I'm doing one surgery. I'll do diaphragm. I'll access the bowel. I'll do whatever it takes. Um, even if it's their first surgery and no one's looked in there, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a pretty good idea of what I'm getting into based on careful history, careful exam, ultrasound, and maybe MRI. So some of us can see and treat, but Every, every gynecologist can make a diagnosis okay. and that at least is a foot in the door. So I, I think that model is appropriate even in our country. And it's certainly a model that is uh, used in Europe. Okay. That's fair. You know, I don't know what, why this came to my head, but I remember when I had my surgery, I, I think it was the last surgery I had in a series of surgeries. So I had um, a bunionectomy. I had had shoulder surgery and I will tell you, my um, laparoscopy, I mean, it was the most painful because I forgot how you use your abs for everything and just trying to get up off the couch. Like every single time I'm like, I hope I don't have to move. I hope I don't have to move. That was, I, that is the one thing I remember is I just, every time I had to move, I just was like, why, 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 why? Yeah. Um, and yeah. I was forbidden from the opioids. So I, um, from all my surgeries. And so I had, I, I don't have an addiction, but I have family who is addicted. And so my doctors were like, do not touch them. So I had this shelf full of opioids. I was like, boy, that's worth a lot of money. And down, down the drain they went. Um, anyways. Um, so that's probably why I hurt so much too. Um, anyhow, so the next 50 years, you know, I'm so curious, like, do you have any wishes or hypotheses about how we'll be looking at endo in the next 50 years because people are working so hard on trying to find other diagnostics i'm sure there's other treatments out there um, that people are looking at so what do you hope to see or what do you think we'll be seeing in the next 50 years well it's, you know it's tough uh, will will we find something that's more effective than surgery that would be nice in some ways sometimes i'm asking myself this feels like so primitive i'm cutting into someone and i'm cutting out their disease and this is all I have. This is the best I have. Uh, it would be remarkable if, if there were a drug without, I mean, that would be incredible, but more importantly, I think understanding some of the etiology, some of what causes it, what are the genetics? How can we, should we be screening all, all teenage, uh, cis females, patients born female, for this disease. So right. yeah, one in 10, we probably should. We screen all women for breast cancer. So I think screening, finding, finding this disease earlier, that will be one of the important things. So I think the, 
that has to happen in adolescence, right? I, I had a teenager or not a teenager. I sorry, I had a 23 year old a few weeks ago, disease from pericardium. I took it off her the sac outside of her heart, the diaphragm, cecum, rectum, all the way through the vagina. Wow. I mean, from here down, she had endo at age 23, right? And advanced endometriosis. And almost all of these patients are told they don't really have anything. They, they're told, here's a birth control pill. We don't need to do anything else. You need to eat better. You need to do yoga. I mean, I believe in eating well and I believe in yoga. Those, we should all be doing that to feel better, but it's not the treatment for endometriosis. And so we, I think it's incumbent upon us is to listen better and hear when someone has pain and actually think maybe we need to do more at this young age, at a young age where we can, can then prevent these later, you know, twenties and thirties and forties bowel resections and invasive procedures. Right. No, which, which can, which the longer you wait, the more complicated they can become. And, yeah. and when you have really advanced disease, it is not without complication to excise it. Right. Right. Even in the best of hands. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I really appreciate everything that you've shared. Um, and it, it is so cool how you started out your career as a massage therapist and then moved into this. And I, I do find when people have like almost a multidisciplinary background, so to speak, it brings such a wealth of resources, I guess is the best word, um, to their current discipline because there's so many different perspectives to bring in and, and you've shown that here. Um, and so I really appreciate that. Is there anything I've missed? Like anything you're like, I, why didn't she ask me this question? I have to share this. Anything that you wanted to add? I, I think I would just add that, um, you know, I'm not immune. Like you said about getting up off the couch after surgery, I've had, I've had three laparotomies which means really? like the big, the big cuts, like up and down across, you know, misdiagnosed ruptured appendix for two weeks that I nearly died from my oh, own infertility goodness. journey. And, and so I think that as a provider, I really, I really understand that surgery is a big, scary thing. Like, right. Like I, I had, I, I had it, I nearly died from, that misdiagnosis. And so, um, it, it, I almost think every surgeon should have to go through something like that to know what it's like to be wheeled into the OR and to feel alone and know you're, you're going under and you have to surrender. It's a huge leap of faith that you're, you're going to trust someone to take care of you while you are completely vulnerable and out. Right. Um, and so, I, I just wanted to say that I, I, I'm not on a pedestal looking down at people with pain. I, I've, I've had my own journey and, and know a bit of what that's like <laughs> to have a hard time getting off the couch and want to try and walk and run again and you can't do it right away. And how also how the body is miraculously able to heal yeah. from all of that. Right. I know it is able to heal. And so that's where yoga and great food and all that really comes into play so that we can heal and go through these really traumatic things and know that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So I, I, I wanted to share that piece. That, Aww. Well, thank yeah. you for doing that. And thank I, I appreciate the, the fact that you shared like what we know, what we don't, a lot of the research and just being very level-headed about this because, you know, that's so important to me to share with the community because this healthcare is hard. It's so complex and endo and like harder add, all the time. add endo to it. It's like, Oh my goodness. So, um, I really appreciate you, you sharing this. And I, I really do hope people enjoy this series of the experts have been fabulous. And, um, and you're, you're you. my, it was a pleasure. You oh. asked beautiful questions. Oh, and thank you. Yeah. I think you're doing a, a wonderful service to, um, bring more light to, this challenging yeah. um, aspect of healthcare. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.